We really appreciate the ongoing support that you give to the State Historical Society of Iowa. We apologize that we cannot serve you in a complete manner right now, but we hope you're enjoying these programs. I have some housekeeping up front, and I want to first of all remind you that we have another lecture scheduled on December 3rd with the very noted scholar and author Paul Hendrickson, who will speak about Frank Lloyd Wright. And I'm sure he'll give some emphasis to the Iowa aspect of that story. I also want to let you know that you're probably all on mute in terms of your own audio. And if you aren't, would you please put yourself on mute so we don't have any complications later on when we play some film clips. Uh, Shelly's going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions. We do ask that you put your questions into the chat box, and we'll try to get to them as, as many of them as we can. Um, I wanted to start out today uh, with the fact that it's Native American Heritage Month, and it's time for us to reflect on the contributions that Native Americans are currently making to our society. I think sometimes we're all too often to talk about Native Americans as if they are part of our long history 150 years ago. But their history dates back tens of thousands of years. They've been settled here in Iowa and living on this landscape for millennium. So I want to acknowledge that by uh, talking about a land acknowledgement statement where we recognize and respect indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that, that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory you reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who've been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It's important to understand the longstanding history that's been brought you to reside on this land and to, e to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. It's also worth noting that acknowledging the land is indigenous protocol and you'll probably hear uh, Shelly speak about that. I had the honor of meeting Shelly about four years ago because she was involved as a very serious water protector and a land steward fighting against the DAFL pipeline talking about the CAFOs and what they're doing to pollute Iowa and leave behind a toxic soil. She's really one of my heroines because she's willing to speak out and to rally people to start rethinking how we look at the world. I know you're gonna find many, many valuable insights in her talk today. And it's important because often we talk about the egregious acts of the white population, the dominant culture that colonized this land, stole lands, stole children, stole languages, tried to undermine religions, the Meskwaki are a very persistent tribe who managed to retain their cultural identity and many of their traditional ways. And we're very fortunate we live here in Iowa with the Meskwaki as our allies. And I'm very honored today to introduce Shelly Buffalo. Shelly is the local foods coordinator for the Meskwaki Food Initiative, Food Sovereignty Initiative. She's the mother of two sons. She's been active in this role for many years now, and we hope she has many future roles to future years ahead of us, and we look forward to having her story today. So I'll turn it over to you, Shelley, and thank you for doing this today. Thank you, Mary. Um, Ida, you know, first off, I, um, I want to thank the um, State Historical Society for Iowa, um, and Mary, um, Jonathan Buffalo, um, uh, who is the, the Meskwaki Tribal Historian. And, um, and of course, Mary from State Historical Society of Iowa, because um, they've really been important um, supporting players in uh, my efforts to promote food sovereignty here for Meskwaki, as well as to communicate the importance of food sovereignty to the larger public. Um, I think that, uh, you know, yes, uh, this month is, um, is, is the month to recognize the contributions of native people, um, you know, to the nation. And um, foods are absolutely at the center of that. So um, I just don't think that, um, you know, we often stop to reflect on the impact of indigenous corn. Um, all, all of the corn now that is grown, um, 
across the globe um, came here from Turtle Island. Um, these, um, you know, the first cultivations were um, developed some 7,500 years ago um, in Central America. And, um, you know, this was crop science. Um, these, you know, um, e even the story of the plant, the, you know, the original plant um, that the, you know, the breeders developed are, you know, what we now know as corn um, is just amazing how this came, this, how this came about. And um, so I want people to really think about that. It's like often um, indigenous people are just, you know, um, especially historically um, are, are described as um, savages, as described as primitive. There's still publications that we access um, you know, for our information about our, our own histories that describe us as primitive. And so I want people to take a pause and, um, and really think about how, um, you know, how that description is um, such a misstate, misstatement. Um, we, we practiced our things, we had a, we, we practiced our act activities, um, we led our lives and we had a worldview that yes, was very different and still, still um, continues to be um, very different from Western civilization. Um, at the same time, um, you can't deny that we had our advanced technologies and, um, and that the impacts of those um, are still being felt today. So this is, um, this is a young lady who I, um, Reagan O'Hanlon, who um, she is, um, you know, the true horticulturalist in the partnership. Um, Reagan has moved on to work for the Iowa DNR starting in November. So um, uh, thank you, Reagan, for all of your contributions. Um, she was my go-to for everything sciency, and um, and uh, definitely, um, you know, she was a very valued partner in our food sovereignty team. And she's right now. She's standing in um, a planting um, of blue Hubbard squash. So it's a type of winter squash that's an indigenous variety and a favorite of the Meskwaki. And then to the left side of that picture, you can see, um, you know, some of our corn, which is um, Tama Flint. Um, and one thing I want to say about this picture of our squash plants is that um, there had been challenges in growing blue Hubbard corn um, in the past. I mean, sorry, got mixed up there. Blue Hubbard um, squash in the past because a type of um, vine borer uh, that was just um, just making it so hard uh, uh, to get those plants um, healthy and productive. And um, last year we established the Kinship Garden, which is a new garden located behind the Meskwaki Tribal Clinic and broke new ground there. It had previously been uh, pasture and, and then it rested for quite a number of years. Um, so really that soil quality really had a chance to, um, you know, bounce back after, um, you know, having been agriculture, conventional agriculture ground in the past. And so what happened was it is that we saw um, really no need to do any serious interventions to get um, this beautiful squash variety to grow out there. And so it was, it was all about the soils. These are the Blue Hubbard um, squash plants in those little mounds there. Those are, um, you know, where they're starting to come up. And, um, and when they filled in in that previous slide, you can see that they just took over. So, you know, we were just thrilled. Um, so I wanna, I know this isn't like a hugely interesting picture, but I do wanna um, take a step back and talk to you about the kinship garden here really quick. Um, we were inspired to develop the kinship garden as a, um, not only as a place to have our primary seed keeping um, activities centered in, 
but also as a way to remove barriers for community members who did not have access um, to growing space. And so, um, you know, we have a population that is made up of um, enrolled tribal members and um, descendants. So um, there are certain enrollment st standards for um, Meskwakis that was um, put in place by the United States government in the 1930s. And so that's what we have had as our, um, you know, counting our tribal membership. So because descendants, although the, they're Meskwaki, um, but because they, um, you know, by and large don't have access to the land like enrolled members do, um, you know, there was this need uh, for gardening space as well as there's enrolled members who just don't have quality, um, quality garden space around their homes or um, that their garden space is exhausted because of successive plantings. And so the reason we chose the kin to name it the kinship garden because we want, wanted it to be based on the Meskwaki kinship system. So this is our, uh, this is our traditional system of how our society, um, you know, it's the structure of our society and it is an amazing um, interconnected web um, that leaves no one person out. And even when we lose a community member, when they have walked on, then we have a system of adoption where we, we choose someone from the community and we adopt, adopt them to take the place of that loved one. And so we, we have a, the kinship system is something that is always replenishes and um, you know it never leaves anybody behind. It's a beautiful system. And um, you know, we want to do everything to celebrate and to continue continue that system. So these are um, these are biwa and bush beans. So these are two varieties. Um, the biwa is a tiny little um, cow pea. And so we can plant it next to the bush bean, which is a white bean. Um, and not worry about it crossing because they're different, they're different types. And so uh, we didn't have our deer fences up yet. And we had to scramble and get that wire netting over those um, because the deer were coming in and munching down on all of it. Um, so the these two varieties of beans are um, Meskwaki varieties. The Biwa, uh, we had, um, we had gone out of the practice of, of um, keeping the seeds and growing out the biwa. So the biwa is one of those varieties that were rematriated um, back to Meskwaki. And so now um, our elders are especially excited um, to have us growing this again because they love the flavor of the biwa. This brings up just beautiful, um, you know, what one of our, the chefs that have, um, that have helped us um, in the past at our community meals, Elena Terry from Whole Chunk, um, what she has described as cell memory. So um, it awakens that cell memory in us. And um, it's just a, it's an incredible healing process. So this is Reagan and I, um, and right there we're planting onions, transplanting. Um, so due to the pandemic, um, you know, our, our um, growing season of 2020 had included um, the hiring of five seasonals. And due to the plant pandemic and budget cuts, as well as the need to uh, make sure that staff um, was practicing, you know, social distancing and um, staying within their quarantine pod, um, Reagan and I had to do all of our um, gardening and seed keeping um, pretty much on our own. There was two of us. And so we just, um, you know, you see Reagan in her sandals and hat and then me in my old jogging shorts and bare feet. And we were just like, um, I mean, we were living it this year. We, um, we had to throw ourselves um, into it. Just, um, you know, our, our entire lives were taken over by this because we um, you know, we, we had been asked to try to grow out as much as we possibly could. Um, and I do really love this. Um, I do really love this picture. It's, it, there's something about it that just really, um, 
I don't know, it just really touches me. Um, you know, this is uh, people coming together, um, you know, women coming together to steward um, the seeds and to grow the food um, and supporting each other. And Reagan is is not from the Meskwaki tribe, um, but she um, she was always um, an incredible ally in her role, and very self aware of her um, role um, in uh, Meskwaki food sovereignty. And that's what it takes to be an ally: is um, um, having you know what's called a uh, cultural intelligence when you come into work, um, or or even you know when you're interacting with an indigenous person, you know develop your own cultural intelligence um, because you know first off do no harm, and um, and if you want to contribute then you you are able to contribute in a meaningful and productive way. Um, one of the activities that we do here for the community is garden tilling. Um, because we identified garden tilling as one of the barriers to gardening. And um, so this is a pretty good sized tract here that the, the picture has. And um, it's for, um, to grow our Meskwaki corn in particular, it takes, it takes a pretty good space um, to get enough corn to, um, to satisfy uh, families' needs. And, um, you know, we, this year, we, we had uh, more people sign up for our tilling services um, than we did the prior year. Uh, so there was a lot more interest in um, traditional gardening and growing our traditional foods. Um, and uh, in large part, you know, that was because of a response to the pandemic, but it's a healthy response. And so we were glad to play our part in supporting that. Here, this would be a, a previous, um, this would be the growing year of 2019. This is one of the photos from our seed and transplant giveaway. And um, here in the picture on the right hand side um, towards the back there is Donetta Wanity. And she um, was working with our program at that time. And um, she was really always brought a lot of energy and ready to engage um, with the community members um, to the, those activities. So this is how we used to do our seed and transplant giveaway is to set up at the tribal center on one day and a second day set up at the um, Meskwaki Health Clinic and let people um, pick and choose what they wanted as far as um, what we had from our transplants as well as um, our seed collections. So this is what this year's um, seed and transplant giveaway looked like uh, because we could not set up and have people come to um, a uh, one location. Uh, we came up with a strategy to um, create these trays, these seed and transplant packages, and then we hand delivered them to porches and gardens um, across the settlement and even some in town for those community members who had um, their town gardens. And then there was some in Marshalltown too um, that participated in our program. And um, so, because it's, it's and this, uh, this year, the spring of 2020, we had, um, we had more, we had uh, increased demand um, for these packets than we had in prior years because there was a lot more people. Once again, that response to the pandemic was to grow your own food, um, a very healthy, resilient response by our community. So um, <laughs> um, this, um, this picture really isn't that significant. This is me and this is the Taos Pueblo squash um, from my family plot. Um, I, I love it because my outfit matches the squash. Like I really, really, really love the squash. This is, um, it is important because it's a part of the rematri seed rematriation story, um, which is happening across Turtle Island. And um, it's an ever growing, amazing network um, by and large led by Rowan White of Indigenous Seed Keepers Network in partnership with other organizations, which, which includes Seed Savers Exchange. Um, and 
you know, just like the biwa seed, that cowpea seed, um, many of our seeds, um, you know, we we grew out of uh, we we grew out of practice of keeping year after year, um, as our foods were replaced um, with a you know what you would call you know your basic American diet of um, more of the shelf stable um, processed foods, and as well as um, you know people um, you know the fact that. Uh, people weren't, less and less people were, were living on their tribal lands. Um, you know, you have to have access to space as well as knowledge, as well as the time. And, um, and then too, um, you know, about knowledge keeping, the boarding school era of removing children from their communities and their families, you know, um, the very purpose of that activity was to replace um, all of their traditional um, um, ancestral ways with, um, you know, the, the practices and the language and the knowledge of, of Western civilization. So um, that really, that really dis disrupted our relationship with these seeds and these foods. So although the Taos Pueblo Hubbard isn't a um, historically a Meskwaki squash, um, it's really um, fantastic um to be able to grow it out here which i did this year and the route that it came to me was through elena terry who um who um you know she was um she was part of a, a group of people that helped to rematriate these seeds um to the taos pueblo and um and as a chef she brought back these seeds to um you know, to grow out. It's one of her favorite squash to cook. And so um, spring of 2019, she brought the seeds to Grant Shadden at Red Earth Gardens, which is our vegetable production farm here at Meskwaki. And Grant um, grew out this variety. And in the fall, in September, we were able to harvest it. And Elena came back as a chef um, for one of our community meals, and she cooked the squash for the um, as one of the dishes for that community for our community, and um, and so from those squash I saved the seed, and then this year I planted it, and it just it grew so amazing, and it's so pretty. Um, so that's um, I don't know, it's just this. Um, that's that's really the essence of why I love this picture is because of the those connections and because of how the seeds just you know once we once we become aware of them you know like they're out there and they want to be they want to be back with us they want to be back they want to renew that relationship with us just as much as we want that relationship renewed with them so this is one of the workshops that we held last year and um it's uh just, um, you know, the workshops are pretty straightforward. It's um, our, our Meskwaki word for squash is wabigun. And um, this variety here in the picture is um, striped kusha. It's a lovely variety. It's also a favorite of the Meskwaki because it has um, a more pliable, thinner skin than the Hubbard varieties, which are pretty thick and tough skins, um, which makes um, them a lot easier to keep um, before you need to process them. But these guys here are, uh, they're a winter squash, but they're easier to peel and cut up. So that is the striped kusha. Um, it's been de-seeded and cut up. Um, I did that, that was like my, my first attempt at sun drying the squash. And so some of those slices are rather thick. And I learned that, um, and especially by accessing the knowledge keepers here at Meskwaki, um, I, um, you know, I learned that we need, you know, I needed to uh, slice those a little bit thinner to get them um, drying uh, faster because these took a, a couple extra days in the sun to dry um, before they were ready to store. So this is, uh, this workshop um, was a partnership with Meskwaki Diabetes Program. And um, we had, uh, you know, our workshops um, are just lovely because 
um, you know, it's it's that chance to really um, engage with community members um, in a in a small setting uh, where they can ask questions. And we always have elders show up, so we have knowledge knowledge keepers um, that um, quite often can can answer those questions better um, better than we can. Um, and uh, because of uh, the pandemic, of course, we can't have in-person workshops. And so I, I will leave time to um, discuss a little bit like how the program has changed um, over this past year because of um, um, you know, different effects from the pandemic um, and how we've kind of realigned our activities. So once again, this is a um, this is one of the activities that um, you know we we are not going to be able to do this year. Hunters Feast, um, and it's over the years, um, it's had different names. This is the name that we landed on uh, for last year's Hunters Feast. Um, so it's a community meal uh, where we have. Um, we have different types of game meets. Uh, we put out call out to um, hunters um, for different types of game meets. And we want to, um, we want to celebrate our hunters um, and as well as those foods and reconnect people with um, their natural environment and understanding, um, you know, as well as a seasonal way of eating. Um, that's that traditional way of living with the land. Our hunters brought us not only um, deer, but we had, I'm trying to remember, we had such a wonderful variety last year. We also had beaver, muskrat, squirrel. Um, let's see, let's see if there was any other. Of course, we had bison because um, Meskwaki Natural Resources manages a bison herd for the tribe. Um, anything else? I think... I think that's it. I probably forgot one or two there. Um, and at this meal, we had local cooks, um, including um, Jolene Davenport, who prepared the squirrel and dumplings dish. And that went so fast. I kind of had to tell everybody, like everybody share, just take a little bit because we want people to have a taste. Um, it's, I, I know it probably sounds odd to a lot of the audience out there, but it is incredible. Um, and um, so we had our, our local cooks who contribute to these meals, as well as we invite chefs from um, our, our larger food sovereignty network in the um, upper Great Lakes Midwest region. And it really is a community favor. So favorite. So we look forward to bringing that back when we're able to. This is one of the activities that is done with the Meskwaki Settlement School. So this is tapping maple trees to make maple syrup. And um, it's something that different partners in, in the tribe have partnered with um, the school to do the activity. Um, Food Sovereignty um, in recent years took that activity over. And so we're just trying to get the kids um, out in the woods and doing some hands-on activities and being able to, um, you know, observe in the process um, to make, make maple syrup. It's it's one of our uh, staple Meskwaki foods, um, and it's um, I I make it personally. I learned from um, my parents how to do this, and so. Um, it's just, it's one of my favorite times a year because it's when everything is coming back to life. Like, you know that even though there's no leaves on the trees yet and we don't have green things popping up through the ground, um, as soon as those days are above freezing and sunny um, and you tap a maple tree and you start collecting that sap, you know that everything is coming back to life and waking up and and it's a beautiful gift. It's um. It's the best. It's just uh, we cook that um, we cook that sap over an open fire, and so um, we uh, you know it it imparts a unique flavor that you won't find um, on the store shelf. In the uh, spring of 2018, uh, the Meskwaki Tribe hosted the Great Lakes Intertribal Food Summit here. Um, it, it was at um, Red Earth Gardens, which is located be behind our casino. Um, the activities also, um, many of the meals and activities were also hosted by the casino in the convention center. And um, 
this uh, this was the first food summit that I, that I attended because that was um, that was my first year employed with the um, back at the tribe here after returning, and um, and I worked with Red Earth Gardens. But this really this summit really launched my um, engagement with um, our traditional food ways in ways that like I, you know, I had um, always wished for, but had had found difficulty really accessing. Um, the, the food summit lasted um, May 9th through 13th. And I have to say that, um, and this was, um, this is Great Lakes intertribal region. So um, we had chefs and we had knowledge keepers um, coming from all over the region to, um, to conduct workshops, um, including the one advertised here. So it's a traditional harvesting, it's whole animal harvesting. So every part is used and it's a community effort um, so it's very much in, in our traditional ways of doing things. And, um, but the foods, it was all indigenous foods for all of those days. And I committed myself to not eating anything else. And those, I have to say, that was the healthiest, healthiest days of my life. Um, I ate so much. But of course, because I was working and really busy and running around, um, I was amazed to find out that I had like lost weight at the end of the, the week. I figured, you know, I would have gained 10 pounds, but it's because I think like um, these foods are so nourishing, you know, that, um, you know, my body was healing itself. And as well as like the inflammation in my body, um, you know, was was correcting itself it's it was incredible experience so um you know now because of the pandemic we um you know the the organization that puts on this summit was unable to have the in-person food summit so we do look forward to um being able to have that in person there's just nothing like it um this uh, last spring summit was virtual um, so we're, but we're looking forward to days when we can get to, to get together again and, and learn from each other again like this. So um, this is uh, one of the uh, Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiatives that um, was put together um, before I came into the program. And it's one of the ob objectives that was accomplished um, through our uh, Food Sovereignty Strategic Plan. Um, developed in 2013. And um, it's also one of um, this cookbook we intend to update and to add more recipes to. Um, I love the illustration on the cover um, that comes from a book. Um, you can see it's um, Tom Wilcoxon and Elizabeth Carvey, um, 12 Moons, A Year with the Sock and Meskwaki, 1817 to 1818. Um, so I encourage people to look into, you know, if they want to learn about the, um, ancestral, um, you know, um, how, uh, Meskwaki people lived and, and how they, they grew their food, um, you know, take a look. Um, I think you can find that book on, um, you know, online if you're interested. So here is a good place to kind of start wrapping up. So this is um, our Tama Flint corn. This is, um, we have kept this seed and have been growing this food um, as Meskwaki people for thousands of years. Um, it's been very hard for, um, for scientists to really date exactly how long. Um, you know, the, the dating can range from three to 4,000 years. Um, many, 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 many generations. And so this, this food is part of our cell memory. You know, you take Tama Flint um, away from Meskwaki and ultimately, you know, we, you know, that makes it impossible for us to be Meskwaki anymore. That's how important it is. It's imp important in our ceremonies. Um, we have, you know, we have many, many stories um, about this corn. Um, and it is, it is a measure of a person's wealth.
um, not just um, historically, but to this current day. Um, that remains like if if you have this corn, if you are able to um, grow and process it, um, then you know, depending on how much you're, you are able um, to produce, that's a direct measure of your wealth as a Meskwaki person. You know, there's a video that um, is um, narrated by Jonathan Buffalo, our tribal historian. So I'd rather have him speak to that. Um, you know, I, I love to hear Jonathan talk and, and he really puts, um, he really puts uh, things in beautiful ways in a beautiful perspective. So um, before we go to that video, I just wanted to um, kind of wrap up with um, maybe reflecting over the last year for Meskwaki Food Sovereignty. And um, we have we have undergone such uh, dramatic changes in circumstances, um, primarily because of the pandemic. So I mentioned the 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 you know staffing cuts. Um, there's been reorganization. Uh, a wonderful new development is that starting October 1st, we were transferred to um, be within the Workforce Development Program. Um, workforce Development has, um, has a, um, a program that helps people um, to, to either re-engage or, or engage um, with workforce um, it's people who um, need development of those soft skills um, in order to, um, you know, be able to go out and, and find employment and be, um, especially with, with, the, with the tribal operations, um, you know, our local economy, and feel that they have a place within that system, um, as well as developing those essential skills um, for employment. And... Um, and the reason why this is such a wonderful development is because um, so their their uh, their training program is called PTEC, Promoting Tribal Economies, and it is um, it's going to work hand in hand as an incubator um, for for giving people the experience of growing um, of growing. Uh, their ancestral foods and to developing their skill set in, in, in ancestral food ways, um, which um, not only includes farming and hunting, but also foraging. Um, and so all of those, all of those just amazing, um, all of that amazing food knowledge that not only that knowledge that we're revitalizing and not only the seeds that we're rematriating, um, but also all of that knowledge and, and those seeds that we have that we have maintained, um, you know, our knowledge of because of of our unique situation of um, you know the Meskwaki people having the tenacity to hold on to their ancestral ways, as well as the strategic vision to establish the Meskwaki settlement to begin with, which allowed us a level of autonomy. Um, that um, other tribes that um, were delegated to reservations just didn't have, and so we still have um, we still have many knowledge keepers, and um, and uh, we value them um, above all else, including our seeds. So um, so in that uh, one of the things that my my new director and I have developed is we we right away we got together and we wrote uh, a. Um, a new position for Meskwaki Food Sovereignty, which is the ancestral farming specialist. And so, um, you know, um, we're looking to be able to bring somebody on before Christmas. And um, and the one of our main goals is resource development. So we're looking at developing um, videos. Um, so like the workshop that we looked at earlier, um, the you know squash processing workshop that would be in video form. Um, the um, the uh, squirrel and dumplings dish that I was talking about, we're going to have Jolene back, and we're going to have um, we're going to do a little cooking video um, 
with Jolene and um, so that um, our community members have access to that and so that they can start doing that themselves, that they don't have to, um, you know, I guess in a way, you know, kind of stick your neck out there to start asking people, how do you do this? How do you do this? Because that's, that's hard. Um, we, uh, you know, people don't want to admit what they don't know. And, um, but I, I try to remind people that we're all learners here. So please, you know, um, please ask and please, um, you know, find a way to engage. And we're trying to remove those barriers um, to that learning. So if you would cue video number one, um, and let's watch that together. Our creator said that how much we take care of our crops is how much we take care of our life. If you lead a good life, you have a good garden. If you ignore it, then you ignore your life. That's the beginning of our garden traditions. A hundred years ago, when we had our last village, everybody had the same rules of survival. You have to make enough food to survive the winter, which goes back to the Meskwaki saying, Pai Asad Messi Gwag Kiketemagas. If you don't have corn, you're poor. Our corn is what's called Tama Flint. Every time archaeologists find Tama Flint, they can be assured that we were there. We've had corn at least 3,000 years. We're not desert Indians. We're not Southeast Indians. We're woodland Indians and we know how to survive in this environment and our crops help us survive our environment. Because us Meskwakis, we could give up this. We could give up this and go back, some of us. But if we lose our crops, then we're in trouble. But as long as we can feed ourselves, We'll be okay. Shelly, that was superb. We learned so many interesting things from you and we honor you and commend you for your efforts. It's so amazing to see how this has become a collective community-wide effort. And I know that's partly because of your passion for it. Uh, I think we should all go down to our reaction box and give Shelly a great big round of applause with the little screen pictures or whatever. And I, and I believe that we're ready to take some questions through the chat, some of them related to Tama Flint, so I think that's sort of been answered, but I'm going to let Allison take care of this. I neglected to thank Allison Johnson, Anu Tawari, Charles Scott, and Hang Nguyen for making all of this possible in terms of the technical side of things. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Shelly and Hang to do some question and answers right now. Okay, uh, so the first question we had was um, Hang got from an email. Uh, and the question is, let's see here. Um, what can non-native folks do to support Meskwaki food sovereignty and more broadly indigenous resurgence? Um, that's a good question. And I think it, um, um, you know, I think back to the um, slide that, that 
we viewed um, with the picture of Reagan um, and I planting together. And, um, you know, think back to how I described, you know, the relationship that Reagan um, had in her role um, working with Meskwaki Food Sovereignty as an ally. Um, so she, Reagan came in with, um, um, you know, a type of cultural intelligence that's so important. So, you know, first off, you know, you, you, you have to step back, I guess, from your own ego and to um, kind of take look, you know, take, take inventory of um, a, you know, the, you know, the place of privilege that you come from. And, um, you know, that, and also, you know, like all of us, that your words and actions matter. And that, um, and as well as that we're always learners. And so um, one of the, the biggest way to be a powerful ally is, um, as I heard from other indigenous activists is for, is for the, the people in places of privilege um, to get out of the way. And that means to make space, um, to instead of controlling the narrative, you, you seek out those native voices and you, you listen to them, you make space for them to um, speak their own narrative. Um, in any of these given circumstances about our food, about our education, um, um, look at how, you know, in my talk, how I mentioned um, um, us being described as primitive people. So um, I think, um, you know, ultimately, like one of the most powerful ways that you can be a true ally is, is to search within yourself and ask your questions, ask, ask yourself the question, where, where are my inherent biases? You know, okay. what, what have I been taught that that is misinformed? Great. Um, let's see. So here's a question from Doug. It says, are any of these plants available in the wild or have they been developed and domesticated for so long? And then he also says, is the town of Tama, Iowa associated with the name of Tama Flint Corn? If so, how? Um, it's the, yes, um, Tama, um, Tama, Iowa, where the Meskwaki tribe are, um, were located um, just a few miles from the, um, the town of Tama. Um, and Tama itself is, uh, it's a native name. Um, but Tama, Tama Flint, it just, it, it gives that location. Um, so this is, you know, um, you know, we have our own Meskwaki names for corn, our corn in all of its forms. Um, but Tama Flint is, is a way for, um, you know, horticulture, uh, for uh, the non-native world to, um, you know, to name our corn. Um, sorry, I don't, I, the, what was the other part of the question? Uh, are any of these plants available in the wild or have they been developed and domesticated for so long? Um, these plants have been domesticated for thousands of years, thousands. So the corn, uh, corn was domesticated, domesticated, um, you know, something, uh, you know, over 7,000 years ago. Um, the, uh, you know, our Meskwaki beans have been with us almost as long as our corn. So that's at least 3000 years um, and um, in similar the squash. So you're not gonna find wild counterparts, but in mentioning wild foods, we, our ancestral diet um, consisted of a huge diversity of wild foods. Um, so that's like a whole nother area that we can go on and on again about. Okay. Um, so Audrey asks, is there any effort to collect and process native wild rice in Iowa? I live near Big Wall Lake in Wright County, and I would love to help protect our rice or protect the rice and care for it. Um, so, um, you know, people have looked into the possibility of wild rice in Iowa. Um, there's, you know, there's wild rice is not a domesticated food. So it's going to pick where it wants to live. Um, and so where it currently 
um, where it currently uh, grows is you know, where it can grow. So it needs certain conditions. It needs very clean water and it needs um, flowing water. And so those, um, the tribes of um, the upper Great Lakes, um, you know, Meskwaki, many um, have, uh, you know, we describe those tribes as um, the rice eaters. And certainly when Meskwaki had their villages um, in that territory, we also gathered and um, we also gathered and, and incorporated wild rice as part of our diet. But um, the potential of propagating it here, I think is um, it's problematic because of those factors that it is a wild food. Okay. Um, so Paul is asking, he says, Turtle Island has been mentioned. Can this be explained? Um, Turtle Island is all of what um, is considered North America. Um, it is called Turtle Island because of the particular, um, our, because of our cosmology on how this land came to be. Um, in general terms, that's how it can be described. And um, so Turtle Island, it's, um, it's also an understanding that um, the borders have no meaning for indigenous people, that we are all indigenous. So um, the tail of the turtle, um, which is um, you know, the, the southern part of, um, of North America, um, that's indigenous. The head of the turtle, which reaches up into the Arctic, that is indigenous and from, from the east to west coast where um, the feet of the turtle extend out, that is indigenous. And we are, you know, we are all indigenous and this is indigenous land. Okay. Um, so he, he, the other question I guess is, have the seed savers in Decorah shown interest in the preservation of Native American seeds? Absolutely. Seed Savers in Decora is a powerful partner in, um, the, in seed keeping as well as in seed rematriation because Seed Savers is, um, is a um, you know, repository of heirloom seeds, which in you know, all of the heirloom seeds of, of Turtle Island are native seeds. So even the seeds that were advertised in um, catalogs as being a certain, um, you know, hybrid, um, you know, a, a certain, I don't know, uh, um, a certain specialty of whoever that that um, whoever that grower was, um, they all have indigenous roots, and as we're re identifying. Um, you know, the seeds that, that we used to cultivate um, partnerships with seed savers and, and um, the indigenous seed keepers network enable us to find those seeds in the collections that match the ones that, that we have in historic um, preservation, um, you know, in the form of pictures and even in the form of um, um, seeds that were gathered by the Field Museum over a hundred years ago. Um, they're, most likely not viable, but they are a historic record. And so it's through these partnerships, like Seed Savers is absolutely wonderful. We have a, a seed rematriation partnership with them currently and two other growers um, in Minnesota and Wisconsin um, that are um, from indigenous communities. Great. Um, Adriana asks, uh, where can I learn more about the new position that's just been created? Um, so the new position is going to be um, closing out soon, but you can you can view it on the um, Squawky, um, gov website. Um, I um, I know that website is being uh, reconstructed, but um, I believe if you um, let's see if yeah, I can't give you the exact navigation, but it's on there. Um, okay. There's, you know, you navigate to, it may be about or it may be in government, but there is a drop down menu where you can see employment opportunities and it'll be advertised on there. Okay. Um, 
I think we're about at one o'clock. Uh, Mary, did you want to do any more? I think we've answered most of the questions. Um, no, think I we think we just all, if we could give her another virtual round of applause. Okay. It was just yeah. really very, very grateful for your time today. Thank you for being on uh, Talk of Iowa earlier today and helping to promote our event. And we wish you a fabulous growing season in 2021 and hope that you have many more feasts. Thank you so much for your dedication, Shelly. You're really a wonder. Thank, thank you, you so much. Everybody, let's thank her. All right. Thank <laughs> and you. thank you to all our participants. It's nice to see you, Tracy and Nicole, all the way from Pennsylvania and people from around Iowa. So thank you for joining us. And please come in again for one of our Iowa Stories lectures. Thank you so much.